Viewers like you make this program possible. Support your local PBS station. In this episode of Mind of a Chef, Sean Brock travels to Senegal in search of ingredients. These are all the things that I've been searching for, you know. These are the things that really are the backbone of this cuisine. Techniques. By smoking it, that's a way of preserving it so that it can sit in the sun. And traditions. Her mother taught her. Grandmother. Oh, wow. That connect West Africa to the cuisine of the South Carolina low country. It's a catfish. Yeah, it's a catfish. This is a fish market. <laughs> How many people get to see this? I feel very lucky. This is the real deal. This is what I wanted to see. I want to eat like this every day. How do you like it? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Enter the mind of a chef. God, I love cooking food. It's the coolest thing. Man, that's Coming to West Africa for a Southern chef is extremely intense. It's overstimulation because you kind of dream up what this is gonna be like. By studying low country food and reading so much about the West African connection, you kind of paint this sort of romantic picture in your head and uh, more often than not, that's usually not the picture that you find. All of our agricultural techniques that we use in the low country were taught by the West Africans. I wanted to come here because this is where it all started and this is where it came from. It's not just about food, you know? It's like food is just what brings this all together. But for me, this is really more about kind of understanding why things are the way that they are. And, and in order to do that, you've really got to be very patient and be very observative. It's our job to become more and more educated about food and why it is what it is and does what it does. And trips like this are essential for that. Welcome to the Sandaga Market, where you can find all kinds of products. Everything. From fabrics to food to CDs, belts, shoes. Underwear. Underwear. <laughs> everything basically that you need. In order to understand the cuisine and the culture, you have to really visit the market. That's where the cuisine comes from. I'm searching for that link between low country cooking and West African cooking. And so it's really important for me to understand the West African pantry and West African cuisine, because that's the biggest cultural influence on low country cooking. He has Carolina rice, it's pretty cool. This rice came into the Low Country in 1685 and became one of Charleston's major cash crops. It was indigo, cotton, and rice. And so there was 100, 150 years probably where we were exporting this all over the world. So I'm sure there's traces of it all over the world being grown, but it's the same DNA. It's the same Carolina rice. And so it's so fascinating to see it here. My grandma's name is Carolina. So as a child, I thought that rice was named after her. <laughs> Fatty leaves this really amazing person that on my first trip there, I connected to immediately. She was the first person that I met and the first person that I cooked with. We spoke about food the same way. We got excited about food the same way. And the more we began to talk, the more I discovered all these things that I now use in my cuisine that I didn't see coming. So now we reach the fermented. This is my favorite part. That's your favorite part. Yeah, this I is what really blew me away the most. Okay. last time I was here, because it makes the dishes here so similar to the taste of our dishes because of the use of pork. That same depth and flavor that you get and that sensation that you get. Mm. So these this are little is called pan, pan, it's a shell. And this is fermented dried oyster. No smoking? No smoking. 
Would you have yeah. So they boil it yeah, and get rid of the shell and then dry it. And it gets, the more it shrinks, kind of shrink, the more you get like the flavor kind of concentrated. So this would give you like the same flavor of like adding country ham to something. It's that same part of your tongue that's activated. And it's kind of the same process. Yeah. And what in the world is this? It's still, it's a dried fish. It's a catfish. Yeah, it's a catfish yeah. as well. Mm. She's saying that it's very good. Uh, that's the bigger one, the big catfish. That's still catfish. catfish. Yeah, it's still catfish. So this isn't smoked, this is just dry, salted and dry. Salt and dry. I'm gonna do that. This is like a sea clam, right? Yes, a big one. Like a sea snail, sea, sea clam. Sea snail. These are all the things that I've been searching for, you know, these are the things that really are the backbone of this cuisine, and it's what makes it so unique. You really don't see that in southern cooking. Preserved fish, preserved seafood, preserved shellfish. But there, it's just everywhere, and it's in every dish. And it gives all those dishes a very unique flavor and soul. My first thought was, why aren't we doing this? It makes so much sense. We'll preserve a pig leg, but we won't preserve an oyster. It has a fantastic shrimp flavor. That flavor that you get from preserved dish and shellfish in West Africa fits perfectly in our cuisine. I think it has its place in Southern cuisine, and I think it's an enormous missing element in, in our, in our on our palate. It's like shrimp jerky. This would go over very well in the South. Goats everywhere here. Everywhere you look, there's a goat. It should be like that in America. Like goats all over New York City. If you look back at the very beginning of low country cuisine, it's important to understand who was cooking the food. And it was West Africans. So you're getting traces of not only the cooking techniques, but the flavor profiles with that depth of flavor that they're getting from all the smoked fish and dried shellfish and fermented seafood. Like if a dish were a song, that base flavor is really the foundation of that song. It's the tempo. You get that same thing when you eat most of the dishes in Southern cooking. You'll find that they have that particular depth. So you can kind of see that connection it's not the same ingredients, and that's what fascinates me. It's kind of a way of thinking and a particular palate. It's like the missing link. One of the neat things about traveling is you see how people utilize their geography to get by, to survive. This is insane. When you go to these coastal towns and you see people living off the water, that's what fascinates me. That's what's so cool. I mean, you see this enormous body of water and it's full of fish, but it takes skill to catch that fish. And to set up those programs and those systems where it's all used properly is just fascinating. That just happens over time. That's just being smart. So seeing people live off the ocean is just amazing. Like, this is a fish market. <laughs> different stations everywhere, like people scaling fish, gutting fish, selling fish. Like you really smell it too. What's crazy is to think this goes on every day. And these people are using every single part of the fish. Nothing goes to waste, not even the guts. That's fertilizer. And they're not, and they're not doing this because they think being sustainable is a trend. <laughs> you know, this is, a, this is a way of life. This is just smart living. We learn a lot here. We are in Embur, one of the main fishing area of Senegal. And in the place where we are right now is called Mbaling. Baling is famous for its smoking fish. This is a major economic activity. They will take the fish from the fishing market and they pull it all over here, full of... Just fresh? Yes, all fresh. 
If you go to any legit barbecue place in the South, you're gonna find this exact to the T design. I'm sure this design has been here forever and ever and ever, and that got translated into American barbecue. So again, like a missing link. Are they smoking with sugar cane or sorghum? Straw and millet. So the farmers are taking something that would normally decompose in the field the and not be used for anything. Yeah, yeah, They're bringing it here as a, as a smoke uh, As a smoke, as wood fire. And they get smoke after, fish. Yes. In return, they got some uh, smoke fish. And also with the scratch, they make fertilizer. Ah, with the, scrub. the farmer will come back, come back also. and use this as the compost. The compost. Now the final step is to take it to stack. It is a stack. So this is the salting area where they salt it? Yeah, yes, with the salting areas. They put salt on it, and once it gets dry, then they lay it out on the store. So how long does this get salted? How many days? It can, uh, it can take around uh, just one day or two days. That's it? Yeah, that's it. And after you can... And then how long in the sun? Uh, just uh, one week at least. The longer it, it stands on the sun, the better it is. Ah. So like they take all the scrap that's not sellable, instead of throwing it away or using it as fertilizer or whatever, they actually mix it with the salt, which adds a more intense flavor. And that's what they're layering that with. So that would be like me taking my country ham scraps, grinding it through a meat grinder, mixing it with the salt, and then curing a ham in that. So it's like the idea of wrapping a flavor around itself. I'm gonna steal that idea for sure. <laughs> The difference between this and smoked fish in America is the fermentation process, the week that it spends in the sun. In America, we'll salt it, pull the moisture out, and then smoke it for flavor. Here, they're smoking for preservation, but it also adds flavor. And then they're getting that intense depth of flavor, that umami, from the fermentation that occurs while it's sitting in the sun, which is what makes such a great stock. It's almost like a concentrate, like a stock cube that's, let's say, poultry concentrate, but it's the natural way to do it. It's basically a fish bullion cube. So what's neat about it is they're doing the reverse of how we cure. They're smoking it first, then they're salting it, and as it's sitting here, it ferments. We do the opposite. We salt it, pull the moisture out, hang it, let it ferment, and then smoke it. Just guessing, one of the reasons they do it the opposite way is because fish is so perishable. And by smoking it, that's a way of preserving it so that it can sit in the sun. I think if you were just to take the fresh fish and salt it, it would go bad. So that first step ensures that it can sit and ripen in the sun. And the longer it sits in the sun, the better it is. Just like the longer a country ham ages, the better it is. If I hadn't come here and seen this, I would have just taken the mentality of the way we cure salt, ferment, smoke, and then that would have failed. So this is very cool. Camp from, uh, from oh. It's this incredible symbiotic relationship between the fishermen, the artisans, and the farmers. They all work together, they all help each other out, and in the end you get this beautiful product. So it's this beautiful circle that's just connected with these three groups of people that are all doing their own thing and all supporting each other.
cattle and to your village. We're gonna cook a really cool dish that I had here the first time I came that includes two of my favorite things, this beautiful broken rice and these amazing cow peas. And uh, this dish is very similar to a dish that we cook. Um, we call it Hoppin' John. You know, it could be this and then anything else, but this one's very unique because it has some very unique ingredients. My mom was telling me when she started cooking at the age of nine, chebuyap was one of the dishes that they were cooking in the menu, the family menu, basically. Her mother taught this to her? Grandmother. So oh, wow. it's a dish that I fancy. And I think the one with the fermented seafood is even better. Walk me through all these ingredients, because there's some crazy stuff here. Well, we have the broken rice, the fermented fish that we will add to give flavor. And you'll have the vegetables, onions, chili, carrots, cassava, and bitter aubergines, eggplants. These are so cool. I love these so much when I came that I planted these this year. That noise, when you hear it in a house, it means that something is going something on. Something good is going yeah. on. Yeah. One thing that's really cool when vegetables are included in dishes is they're often left whole or in very large pieces because it's a one-pot dish and that keeps them from breaking up and sort of disintegrating into the dish. Yes, yes. We don't cut it because we boil a dish actually for like long hours. So we put the vegetables in like one piece. So, so what's neat is like that when that eggplant goes in whole like that and sits in the pot, it acts like a sponge and just soaks up all that broth, all that yeah, stock. Yeah, all the broth. Ab so absolutely. good. Absolutely. What do you think, Sean? Yeah, I think uh, I almost got the peas done. Everything is ready. The vegetables, the peas, the onions, the meat. So we can start cooking. Great. Great. Let's do it. This is lamb we're using. It's like the shank? Yes. It's very important that it is like long cooking process because you'll get all the flavor reduced. Now I'm gonna add the seafood, the fermented snail, wow. a bit of gage, our national component ingredient that you would find basically in any dish in Senegal. I love the combination of fish and, and meat, but not just fish, like this fermented, deeply flavored, intense preparation that just like, when you smell it, when it hits the pan, it just like seems so natural with the lamb, like, so perfect. So, meat's getting close. The broth is like, yes, wow. crazy delicious. A bit of chili. Nice and whole. Carrot. So this is what we call nokos, that we're adding once the broth is reduced. It adds more flavor. Holy cow, that smells good. Too cool. She's telling me that eating was a way of educating kids. The mom, for example, would just cut the meat and give each piece to everyone. Yeah, staying on your spot is very important. I should uh, be doing, here. for example, this. 
Oh. I do that. That's very impolite. It teaches you how to share, it teaches you how to be polite, it teaches you so many manners, yeah, so a, many important lessons. It's a way lessons. of educating. Mm -hmm. And if you drop one piece of, like, some grains on the floor, rice grains, you need to pick it up and eat it, not spoiling. Respect. Yeah. We're showing you how to do the bowl. It's like sushi. So how is your chebuyak? The chili. Delicious. It's very spicy. <laughs> oh, it's so good. It's worth the pain. I really appreciate you doing this. This is so cool. Like, I want to eat like this every day. I think uh, coming here can teach you so many things, not just about food, about being thankful and, and being uh, grateful for what you have and making the best of it and not worrying about what you don't have, being thankful for what you do have. You don't waste anything. You go to the place where we saw fish smoking, you see this perfect circle between all these different groups of people that are working together, not wasting a single thing, not even a fish scale. You go to the fish market and everything is used. It changes the way you break an animal down. It changes the way you write a menu. It changes the way you put a plate together. It changes the way you eat. A grain of rice falls on the floor, you pick it up and eat it. You know, what's kind of interesting is I came here sort of looking for a connection to our cuisine and even more so looking for missing links. And I certainly found some of those for sure, but the overall um, lesson learned was much greater than ingredients in a pot. And, and that's what's so cool about traveling. And that's why you have to travel. You have to get outside of your element and experience these things, or else you'll never grow.